I know that 2006 seems like only the other week, but trust me folks, it was 17 years ago. It's old enough to frickin' drive. Just don't even get me started. It was also the year in which a certain music streaming service popped up called Groove Shark. Well before Spotify, Amazon Music, or any of that gump came into the limelight, Groove Shark offered something that the world was only just being able to conceive, and its story is, well, it's a bit of a journey, so let's get in the groove. To really understand the premise of music streaming, we need to go back a bit further. Napster. But before we do that, let's go back even further with MyHeritage, who I've partnered with for this video. So this is the MyHeritage DNA DNA testing kit. So let's see what we've got. So the process is easy. You get sent a simple swab kit, you swab, then you post your swab straight back to discover your origins and find new relatives. Job done. Whilst you're waiting, you can use some great tools like MyHeritage photo restoration features, which will keep you occupied until you receive your results. I'm excited to see actually how much Scottish there is in me, as I know my ancestors, well, some of them at least, were from there. Forty-one point two percent English, pretty standard. Thirty-three point four percent Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, expected. So mostly east of England. So my family didn't bother moving far, did they? Uh, Italian, 1.6%. Nigerian, 1.1%. You get a nice little map so you can see where everyone is. It's really cool. And you get all these DNA tools, which is great. My Heritage breaks down your origins across 42 ethnicities and over 2,000 geographic locations. Then you can dive into your family tree and find long lost relatives at the touch of a button. You can buy a DNA kit at the link below and use coupon code NOSTALGIA for free shipping. And as an added bonus, you can start a free 30-day trial of MyHeritage Best Subscription for Family History Research and enjoy a 50% discount if you continue to use it. Now, Napster wasn't a streaming service as we know it, but it was very arguably the precursor and relied on the same underlying technology. Sitting as a peer-to-peer file-sharing application on your desktop, Napster would allow you to find torrents of well, pretty much any file you wanted. Very often this was pornography, but also music. A lot of music. I've still got CDs burnt featuring all kinds of late 90s and early noughties remixes, along with prank phone calls, if you remember those. Fundamentally, peer-to-peer -peer is a distributed architecture on a network. In the case of these applications, Bob might have a copy of an MP3 file on his computer, Sally the same. You come along wanting that file, connect up to the network, and can then download it from both machines simultaneously. If Bob switches his computer off, it's no problem because you still have Sally, and vice versa. And of course, Napster wasn't the only peer-to-peer -peer network. Quickly, we had Kazaa, LimeWire, and even more obscure applications such as Madster, formerly Aimster. But as you can imagine, music labels don't take kindly to their songs being downloaded for free and burnt to CD for playing any way you pleased. And soon enough, the legal challenges came. The first was from Metallica, after discovering their latest song was being downloaded before release. This was followed by Dr. Dre before various record companies got in on the action, forcing Napster and its peers, pun intended, to file for bankruptcy in 2002. Other similar services, of course, continued with varying success, but with the internet getting faster and faster, it was clear that a new type of legitimate service could soon be offered. And that's where Groove, nope, nope, sorry, Last FM comes in. Now, internet radio stations weren't an alien concept before Last FM. Surely you remember Real Player, you know, that had lots of different services you could listen to. What Last FM added was audio scrobbler capabilities. This essentially acted like the genius feature of iTunes, by logging details of all the songs you listen to and then building lists of songs you may like to hear. But this was still very much like a radio station, just a more customized station. Now, although a social network, MySpace quickly filled the prior torrenting gap in 2003 and became a place for people to share their music. And Pandora Radio, launching in 2005, offered similar features to Last FM, operating on the Sound Exchange royalty framework, which meant that artists got paid, just like if a song played on a normal radio. But the radio nature again meant you couldn't pick specific songs, but you could skip tracks in exchange for hearing the occasional advert. But it was Groove Shark that really shook up the scene. 
Groove Shark. Groove Shark is kind of a funky name, right? Well, things are about to get a whole lot funkier. Josh Greenberg, this guy right here, the son of an electronics repairman, was a freshman at the University of Florida when he joined his campus Entrepreneurs Club. He wasn't a stranger to this concept. In fact, he'd been running a web design business since the age of 17 with his grandfather acting as chairman. But now, at the ripe old age of 19, Josh wanted a slice of the dot-com bubble and he wanted it quick. He already had web programming skills and so, he decided to loan himself out to anyone in the club who had a plan. It was here that he met Sam Tarantino, another freshman who happened to have a plan. Tarantino postulated that with the death of Napster and various other torrenting platforms, it would be possible to get people to pay for music again, rendering piracy a thing of the past, we've heard that before, whilst making money in the process. And so, joined also by fellow student Andreas Barreto, this was enough to set up a business called Escape Media Group and create a prototype version of Groove Shark which had a similar peer-to-peer -peer sharing capacity to Napster, but where you could also pay for high-quality MP3 downloads. The perceived beauty was that users would be able to buy and sell tracks amongst themselves for 99 cents, 70 cents would go to the record label, 25 to the seller, and 4 cents to Groove Shark. This model had been approved by some smaller record labels, but major ones were yet to latch on. To facilitate, users needed to install Sharkbyte, which managed the downloads. Unfortunately, it didn't stick with the public, who were still hanging on to free torrenting programs like Kazaa and LimeWire, even though they would try to be eradicated. If the difference is minimal, I mean, who the heck wants to pay when you don't need to? Morals were a tricky business in the mid noughties it wouldn't be until 2007 when Groove Shark really found its um, groove. It also had time to see YouTube evolve since its 2005 launch and realized that rather than selling downloadable files, they could just stream music exactly the same way as YouTube did with video. They make a plonk advertising in the stream and completely subvert piracy by abandoning this download model that had been so prevalent. Because if there's one thing we can be sure of, Humans crave convenience. They crave the ability to have their music on demand from wherever they want. This wasn't much different from the internet radio that had gone before, but if you could pick the songs you wanted, that would have a perceived massive difference. The actual streaming application would eventually launch in April 2008, two years down the road from when they started, and almost immediately it was popular. It was evident that Greenberg and Tarantino had hit on a winning formula, combining internet radio, user suggestions, a search feature, and playlists. However, what had suited some of the record labels earlier was now less appetizing. By Groove Shark's new model, music wasn't being sold anymore, it was being streamed, and therefore labels weren't getting their 70 cents. Groove Shark still had some methods for artists to get paid, but if music was being streamed, then arguably it wasn't being copied, and therefore some of the copyright rules were circumnavigated in Groove Shark's opinion. Surprisingly, it was actually a younger user base that turned onto streaming music delivery, those who were not long prior downloading direct from Kazaa. The problem was, Groove Shark at its core still relied on peer to peer infrastructure. If you wanted to play some Dire Straits, then that album would need to be streamed by piecing together parts sitting on other people's computers, and that had its own set of issues. The first of those problems was reliability. Groove Shark was almost completely decentralized. This kept costs down to a bare minimum. After all, if you haven't got to house huge servers and run a massive amount of dedicated infrastructure, then you're saving a buttload of electricity and upfront costs just to start with. That being said, reliability wasn't a huge issue, especially once the platform had found its footing. Even with Naughty's internet speeds, songs didn't take up a lot of bandwidth, and the technology was good enough to keep things ticking along. But the reliability of being able to find the music you want was more of a problem. After all, you could only access what people had already shared. The second and more serious problem was, to the record industry, this whole setup still looked a lot like copyright infringement. After all, with Groove Shark no longer paying anything to record labels, how was this any different from copying your mate's Alicia's Attic CD to cassette tape? How was this different to the Napster battle of 2002? It really wasn't. Technically, the operation was brilliant. It was slick, it was cheap, and for the most part, it was reliable. 
It had also beaten Spotify to launch, but this was a company still fundamentally operated by college kids and it needed to attract some venture capital in order to not only grow, but to sustain its current model. Without the backing of major record labels, this was proving a tough sell. By 2009, it was clear things had to change yet again, and so the first of several contracts was signed with record labels promising to pay royalties for every streamed song. Sure, it meant a few more adverts in between tracks, but if things were back on a legitimate footing, then Groove Shark had a chance to not only dominate the scene, but also attract a load of a new investment. The problem was, by 2009, Spotify had tentatively launched, and even in these early stages, it was making waves, attracting some $100 million of investment in its first year. In comparison, Groove Shark had only managed a million, 1%. Even though GrooveShark had over 30 million registered user accounts, having the upper hand in user numbers, it was surely only a matter of time before Spotify would catch up, and catch up it did. From the go, Stockholm-based Spotify's business model was solid. Rather than peer-to-peer, -peer, Spotify held all the songs on their servers. This required more investment, but also made everything easier to track. It also meant that they could upload any music they wanted, and indeed, that users demanded. Ultimately, their revenue model was based on the same premise that Groove Shark had moved into. Playing adverts amongst songs, and they had already put agreements in place with major record companies that would see rights holders paid between this much and this much per play. This depended on factors such as geographic location, artists' royalty rate, and popularity. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's still equated to 70% of Spotify's revenue. So, Armed with a sound model, a lot of investment, and subsequent marketing, by the time Spotify opened their freemium model up to the UK in February 2010, there was a queue, a huge queue, leading to an invite-only registration service by September. By July 2011, Spotify launched in the States with a six-month ad-supported trial, which again proved highly successful. GrooveShark knew they had to step up, to gain more investment, and importantly, to get the record labels on board. By the end of 2009, they had signed an agreement with EMI to pay royalties on songs and went head-to-head -head with Spotify, and for a while, it worked, reaching 40 million users with 145 employees at its peak. GrooveShark actually managed to attract a reasonable amount of investment by 2011, enough to keep Spotify on their toes and attract a whole new user base, but the underlying lack of management experience would quickly come to light. By 2011, the same year that Spotify was taking over the US, rumblings emerged that perhaps the agreements made between GrooveShark and record labels weren't as solid as they had appeared. It was in fact EMI who would first complain that it had never been provided with an accurate amount of what had actually been streamed. While Spotify's servers were geared up to record every single play of every record, GrooveSharks just weren't. So a deal based entirely on the number of plays was ultimately invalid especially when it didn't line up with the data Spotify were feeding back. Before 2012 had begun, the biggest two record labels, EMI and Universal Music, had decided to sue the living hell out of GrooveShark with a $17 billion lawsuit, quickly leading to their apps being removed from the Apple App Store and Google Play. GrooveShark would fight back by moving to an HTML5 featured website, allowing users to still access their service, through a browser, but this was the era of mobile apps, and if you didn't have one, you might as well not bother. They also added a tip jar feature to try and appease the record labels, a bit of a last ditch attempt, giving users the opportunity to give back to the artists, but by the end of the year, GrooveShark's user base had been slashed in half. Spotify then were in the perfect place at the perfect time. Not only did it mop up the GrooveShark user base looking for music on the go, but it was also growing its own user base through clever marketing and word of mouth. Somehow, Spotify had taken GrooveShark's vision and made piracy uncool, but they'd done it with enough professionalism and importantly money to make it work, and that made everyone happy, especially the record companies. Of course, GrooveShark falling on its ass was hardly a surprise. This was how entrepreneurs tended to operate back on the early internet. If the legalities were dubious, then ask for forgiveness later. Without that, we wouldn't have experienced Winamp and its unlicensed MP3 technology, or even YouTube with its early disregard for uploaded content. 
And so, as expected, by September 2014, a federal judge had determined that GrooveShark's peer-to-peer -peer network was a flagrant violation of copyright law, resulting in a massive win for the record companies and GrooveShark owing upwards of $736 million. At this point, GrooveShark's funds were dwindled almost dry, and with no prospect of further investment, they had no choice but to give up everything the company owned to the record companies. What had really sealed the deal was the revelation that staff had been uploading music themselves to ensure that GrooveShark users had access to as much music as possible. Without this, an argument could have been formed that the onus was on users sharing the files themselves, but with it, GrooveShark had no legs to stand on. In their attempts to compete with Spotify, they had stabbed themselves brutally in the heart. GrooveShark disappeared. All that remained was a web page stating, Dear music fans, today we are shutting down GrooveShark. We started out nearly 10 years ago with the goal of helping fans share and discover music. But despite best of intentions, we made very serious mistakes. We failed to secure licenses from rights holders for the vast amount of music on the service. That was wrong. We apologise without reservation. As part of a settlement agreement with the major record companies, we have agreed to cease operations immediately, wipe clean all the data on our servers and hand over ownership of this website, our mobile apps and intellectual property, including our patents and copyrights. At the time of our launch, few music services provided the experience we wanted to offer and think you deserve. Fortunately, that's no longer the case. There are now hundreds of fan-friendly, affordable services available for you to choose from, including Spotify, Deezer, Google Play, Beats Music, Rhapsody and Audio, among many others. If you love music and respect the artists, songwriters and everyone else who makes great music possible, use a licensed service that compensates artists and other rights holders. You can find out more about the many great services available where you live here. It has been a privilege getting to know so many of you and enjoying great music together. Thank you for being such passionate fans. Yours in music, your friends at GrooveShark. April 30th, 2015. Of course, many GrooveShark users were furious. Do you know of any site that allows you to use any song without prior login, payment or form of obstruction? Wrote one fan in The Independent, which I think sums up the actual problem and why it shut down. But Greenberg's vision was dead. But rather than being the point that this story ends, this is actually the point at which this story gets a whole lot darker. Three months later, on the 19th of July 2015, Greenberg's girlfriend returned to their home in Gainesville, Florida to find him dead in their bed. He was just 28 years old and had spent the majority of his adult life forming and shaping the company that now lie in tatters. The police deemed there were no suspicious circumstances, but an autopsy failed to determine the actual cause of death. In either case, those around Greenberg could not make sense of the tragedy. His mother was quoted as saying that he was in full health, completely dismissing the possibility of suicide by stating he was more relieved than depressed about the settlement as it had ended the long looming lawsuit. Weirdly, this wasn't the first death Groove Shark had suffered. A family in St. Petersburg is still trying to find answers this morning after a wedding celebration turned into a deadly shooting. Eddie Vasquez, who was Groove Shark's director of international sales, had actually been shot twice in the chest in St. Petersburg two years prior, in November 2013. Apparently due to a disagreement between Vasquez and a former University of South Florida classmate, Andreas Rodriguez Torres. Torres was charged for armed kidnapping and second-degree murder, with GrooveShark putting out a statement. GrooveShark as a company mourns the tragic loss of one of its employees, Eddie D. Vasquez. Mr. Vasquez was visiting friends and family in the Tampa Bay area over the weekend when he fell victim to a senseless act of violence. Now, there's no evidence that these deaths were linked, and in fact there's no real evidence that they were mysterious or influenced by external sources, but two top executive deaths at a troubled company is a few too many for my liking especially when they weren't even seen as big news at the time. Newspaper searches will find more stories about this Josh Greenberg, a computer whiz who looks like him but made headlines 20 years prior, than the Groove Shark Josh Greenberg. It's all a little weird. So I'm going to show you Groove Shark working on a, uh, a Palm Free. It's the Groove Shark app. But weird tragedies aside, Groove Shark, unlike Spotify, was in the right place but at the wrong time. 
The late 90s and early noughties had seen a flurry of peer-to-peer -peer networks such as Napster, Kazaa, and LimeWire to name a few. Launching GrooveShark after their immediate demise may have been viable and even with slower internet speeds could have given the business time to mature before smartphones came along and made their own demands. Because by the time they did come along, you needed to be ready, and GrooveShark just wasn't. It didn't have the investment in place, it didn't have the technicalities in place, and crucially it didn't have the legalities in place for a world that wasn't based on the Wild West internet of yesteryear. In a world where the capitalistic whims of Google Play and the Apple App Store were gatekeepers, a college startup based on the ideologies of sharing and freedom was never going to work, at least not in the long term. That being said, GrooveShark's presence was important, as were the people behind it. It's why there's now an annual Josh Greenberg Day at the Gainesville Area Chamber of Commerce, celebrating his birthday. Because the original founders, including Josh and what they created, did a lot. They helped transform Gainesville into a technology hub, they helped show the world that anything was possible, and they helped pave the way from internet radio to proper streaming services. And as Greenberg once said, GrooveShark is essentially the YouTube for music, so um, the analogy there works in, in a uh, wide spectrum, and I, I, I'm very glad that YouTube's around, because it makes the, YouTube, the GrooveShark pitch a lot easier. Me too, Josh. Me too. Until next time, I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo.